Um, the topic of today is um, photography and the self. Then before entering into uh, the topic, uh, let me remind you of my contact details. Uh, YouTube, uh, just search for art tours with a theme and please subscribe my channel. Uh, on Eventbrite, uh, search for Art Cafe so you can track all future events. And then I usually blog uh, on Instagram and Facebook, art with underscore London in Instagram. Um, on my bio in Instagram, there's also uh, the link to Eventbrite so you can see everything that is going on. Okay, so photography and the self. Now, what does that mean? And so I thought that would have been useful to show you three different images that can be labeled photography and the self. Clearly, um, selfies um, are the first place that come to our mind and uh, I put a selfie of mine that I took in London uh, in, at Christmas. But every time we have an image with a self, maybe ourselves or other selves, the key point, if we put the hat of art historians, is to uh, try to understand what are those images for? In this case, why do we take selfies? And we take selfies usually to share with friends and family something nice we uh, are doing. For example, this was Christmas and it's not about myself, but it's about, about a nice time I was having in this beautiful environment. So ideally a selfie starts for a private use, like a sort of postcard that you send to your friends and family. Of course, we can share it on social media uh, but um, ideally, it's dedicated to uh, our network, to our friends. So that's definitely something that goes under the head of photography and the self. The second image that I want to share to give you an idea of what is photography and the self is this sort of image. Uh, it's not called selfie because we all agree selfies are photogra photographs of ourselves that we take with our, with our phones. But this is a self-portrait by Andy Warhol in 1986. And as we all know, artists have been doing self-portraits in paintings, um, in sculpture uh, forever. And Maybe Andy Warhol was one of the first ones who used this new medium of photography, not new in the 80s, but new in the art world. Um, so for sure, the purpose of this self-portrait is very different than a selfie that we could all do. And by opening the question, what is this self-portrait is for, then we can learn more about Andy Warhol's vision. So he took a photography of the self to, to convey his artistic vision. And we are going to explore more later in the presentation. So these are two examples of photography and the self. The third example, I'm sure you have all seen this beautiful photo. It's not a selfie. <clears throat> it's not a self-portrait. <clears throat> Let's say it's a photo portrait that the Duchess of Cambridge has released uh, as an anniversary, let's say for her birthday. Uh, it's highly thought there's nothing left to chance. Again, I'm going to come back to this image later. But the purpose of this third image, of course, it's, uh, it's clear. It's not a selfie. It's not for friends and family. It's not an artistic vision, but it's uh, to build a brand, an image, a, a message, uh, a liaison with the rest of the royal family. So we have seen three examples where uh, we have nothing in common, uh, myself and the other two, uh, characters, let's say people. But what we have in common is the desire to use photography as a mean of self-representation, 
to convey our different goals, our different uh, purposes. So the idea is, um, if I think as an art historian, is the idea to um, go back and see, this is very fascinating, we are surrounded by images of the self, sometimes too much. And um, with our intellectual curiosity, we want to learn more, where has everything started? And then, uh, so a bit of history, let's say, and then I'm going to uh, share with you examples of artists who felt photography and self-representation was necessary to convey their artistic message and to arrive to us uh, in places where, in, in a medium that was better than painting or sculpture, the traditional media. Photography is taking artistic messages uh, to a different places. So let's see where. Um, everything started with daguerreotypes, the first form of photography in 1839. So Monsieur Daguerre uh, shared um, in Paris his uh, discovery, his patent, his idea. He was an, an artist, but an inventor as well. And um, I'm sure you have seen these sort of boxes. They are meant to be the first camera. They needed to be very firm on a tripod. And what they had, they didn't have a roll film as we have, or we've been having since, uh, let's say, uh, early 1900. But they had um, a silver coated uh, copper plate that had some reflective qualities and when exposed to light and then treated chemically, gave a, a sort of positive image is called, like the ones that we can see uh, below. But each image, so this is not printed on paper, it couldn't have been printed on paper, uh, but it was on this uh, plate still. It was one of a kind image that could have not been edited in post-production and uh, it was kind of an expensive process. Now, why do you think these people want to have their daguerreotype taken? So what are these photo portraits for? Let's ask ourselves the same question as the um, selfie before or the photo portrait. So typically those times, uh, those sort of photos were um, for private use, marking the personal relationship between the sitter and the others. So they were typically done to share, to be shared with the loved ones, with the family, with friends. And I found very interesting objects. They were not just simply framed as we may do today. The first example is a fantastic um, frame, but in a box. So this is a daguerreotype photograph of a lady that was then cased into this wooden embossed case. So typically people would have carried those cases with them traveling around or maybe moving them in different floors of their big manors maybe. But even better than that, uh, those daguerreotypes were then may cut out and put in uh, portable watches. Uh, maybe this is something a gentleman would have carried, uh, maybe in gold. Uh, so below the uh, photo, there's still a watch. But even better than that, you have this beautiful pendant. Um, so this could have been uh, precious metal the image of the loved one. So maybe she was the fiancé, she the daughter, um, the friend, the mother of uh, anybody having this pendant. So in this case, it's in a necklace. And look at this beautiful stone that closes the overall mechanism. There's still a watch under this uh, photograph. And you can still find these sort of objects on uh, at auctions, so still online and in presence. But even better than that, look at this beautiful brooch um, where the daguerreotype has been watercolored. And then the reverse or the back of it has the hair 
of the sitter. You cannot go more personal than this. It's, it's really nice. But I found even something better that I like even more. This is a bracelet. And look at this very tender portrait of maybe this was her mother's um, portrait that she was carrying with. So this is a portrait with this beautiful, maybe gold frame. But look at the bracelet. It's made of the hair of the boy. And this hair is knitted. Um, and worked in a way that it's also in different colors. It's a bit weird, I have to say. Maybe we wouldn't feel comfortable in wearing jewels made by hair today. But this is what photography was at the beginning, a very personal object, sometimes with a romantic meaning, sometimes with a um, very, very personal um, attachment. Now, Technology evolved, and from a personal use of self-representation, we go to a still personal, but more reaching a wider audience. Um, there is um, a process called collodion. Collodion process was introduced, um, let's say, 11, 12 years after the gerotype in 1851. And to tell you what collodion is, it's a solution of gun cotton in ether. So it's a sort of cellulose, let's say. Everything starts from a camera. It's not too different from a daguerreotype. Uh, but the, the metal, instead of metal, you have a glass. This glass treated chemically gives um, a negative image. Think of the roll film, a negative image, which then could have been much more easily uh, transformed into uh, a print on paper. But still the negative was cut out and framed or it was printed on paper and then this paper was framed. It was a much cheaper process than the daguerreotype. And the fact it was cheaper allowed to uh, and have a bigger outreach outside to the audience. And here we have a, an image of a family. They look very um, not at ease. <laughs> we can say the overall process must have been very strange. You needed to be very stiff. Look at the child, he's moving and it has ghost-like qualities almost. Now, because the photo was um, cheaper to obtain, even the frame was cheaper typically made of paper rather than leather and silk. So this was, again, a further step to bring photography and self-representation to everybody. It is, however, uh, 1854 that we have a sort of big bang of self-representation in photography because this gentleman, Eugène Disdery, um, patented the so-called carte de visite. So everybody had visiting cards as we have today. And those visiting cards had names and maybe drawings and maybe early daguerreotypes. But he uh, patented a format for those uh, cartes de visite, six by nine centimeters. They were the same sizes of the normal visiting cards. Uh, so everybody related. And everybody went to this Dari to have their daguerreotype or collodion photo taken and printed on a carte de visite format. So this had so much success that even people who didn't need any introduction nor any uh, visiting card like uh, Queen Victoria here went to this Dari, or maybe he went to her palace to have a carte de visite made. Uh, in the first photo, uh, you have Victoria, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. And later, when Prince Albert passed away, uh, Queen Victoria uh, in the late 80s kept on having carte de visite. Now, the question is, why on earth a royal, uh, the queen of an empire, uh, needed a carte de visite? And the answer is that not for private use, for sure. But this because the royals in general in Europe 
started to have a more and more um, a representative role that rather than just a ruling role. And especially after the death of Prince Albert, Queen Victoria withdrew from private life more and more that she needed for her image to keep circulating. And so those cards were done for the public benefit. They were sold and collected, sold in stationers' um, shops or newsagent shops. They were sold in art galleries together with paintings and sculptures and highly sought after, highly collected. Not just in the UK, but in the rest of Europe, Emperor Napoleon III, um, so another royal family, but also um, people famous in other fields. For example, Giuseppe Verdi, the famous composer, um, had his carte de visite taken, not because uh, nobody knew him, but because those sort of images were collected. For example, you went to La Scala Opera House, uh, saw the Nabucco, and then uh, why not buying Giuseppe Verdi's carte visite and say, I was there. Eugène Desiree made another step uh, further towards this industrialization of photography. He patented um, not just the size of the carte de visite, but he patented a camera with more than one lens which allowed to have up to 10 different cartes de visite on the same sheet. So you would have left his studio with just a paper full of your images. There was enough time to change position. And so you could have decided, cut out your image, which one to keep, which one to give out for business reasons, which one to give to your parents, which one to give your, to your fiance. And I chose of the many that you can find online, this carte de visite series of a prince, Prince Lobkowitz from Bohemia uh, in today's uh, Czech Republic. Because I like that the final image is uh, himself with his bathing suit. And I wonder what did he do with this last photo? Um, now, as I said, these sort of images were highly sought after and it was extremely fashionable to go to Desiree's studio. Um, he had also a number of competitors. It was quite easy, it came up. This technology was not very difficult to copy, but Desiree remained really the temple of photography as an art critic said. And his studio was very trendy, very fashionable. So not only you went there to have your photo taken, but you went there to network with other important people. Um, so I guess today is like going to a club or going to play golf in an exclusive place. So you went there to be seen uh, by the people who were there, not just to be seen in photographs. Now, this uh, sort of fashion that became really uh, something you couldn't live without gave origin to a very interesting form of art, the collage or the photomontage. So we have seen those um, carte de visite were used for private use, for public use and for collection. Um, aristocratic ladies in London, in the UK, uh, maybe in other part of the world, but we for sure know the ones in London, didn't have much to do apart from going to parties, let's say. And they collected carte visite of their family and of famous people, and they added a layer to that. They created albums, adding watercolors and drawings and dried uh, flowers, perhaps creating uh, new meanings for those uh, photo cards. Now, you have to remember that what women uh, were doing in, 18th, in the 18th century, in sorry, the 19th century in London, in the UK, a Victorian society was very uh, rich, let's say, growing very fast, uh, fully industrialized. But the role of women, 
under the surface was actually uh, not very good. Women didn't enjoy the same human rights than men. And uh, uh, it was very common for especially rich men to have mistresses and they were tolerated. So if a woman went into court bringing her husband and asking for a divorce because the man was unfaithful, uh, maybe the judge, judge would have said, well, who cares? I mean, it's normal, okay? Women were constrained by those bustiers, so they couldn't move very well, they couldn't breathe very well. And also they couldn't go out mm, easily. Uh, they all had always to be accompanied by a chaperone. So the place of the women were, uh, was home, especially a part of the home that it's called the drawing room. And Victorian houses were built in this way, places for um, the family, places for servants, places for men and places for women, like the drawing room. And what could women do? Uh, reading, sewing, so working with textile, making watercolors, and making collage. Now, you may remember Picasso and Braque. They started to work with collage after 1910. So it took professional artists, male and white, to introduce collage in the artwork and making it um, fine art. But those women have been already doing that uh, for 50 years. So it's, I like this one with the men in the center and all the women around, maybe a representation of this lady, Lady Filmer, who is the most famous and maybe the first artist, non-professional artist that she didn't know she was an artist, who made use of collage. Other example of her artwork, this is her drawing room at home. This is herself. And these are members of her family. Now, she was really an aristocratic lady. She knew uh, the Prince of Wales, who became the king after Queen Victoria, uh, Edward VII, who is represented at the center of the scene. She kindly enough cut out a part of his body because he was built up, was not as thin. It seems the two were friends, or maybe they had a flirt. So she put the Prince of Wales in the middle of the scene. And funny enough, she put her husband in a much smaller dimension close to the dog. Uh, it's very ironic. Maybe uh, her husband loved um, the dog more than uh, he, he loved her, who knows? I also like this other image among many where there's a joker outdoors, maybe at the outdoors of the Lady Filmer couldn't enjoy all by herself, who is playing like a juggler with uh, portraits, photo portraits of somebody I couldn't recognize here. Maybe they are famous people or maybe they are members of the family. And Lady Filmer, uh, right, ironically says, I don't like these people. So all these images have an element of sarcasm and of irony. There's also some commemoration. These are two other albums, beautiful, I think. Uh, this is called Bouvery Album, where in 1872-77, this lady uh, uh, cut out uh, photos of her children, one, two, three, four, and five, and she recreated in watercolors Alice in Wonderland. This was, as you remember, a book that was firstly published in 1865. So, um, so I think seven or eight years later, she recreated the same scene with her children. And last but not least, I love this image of ladies with the body of ducks. So this is uh, Lady Go. Which uh, who cuts out the photographs of her girlfriends and recreates a very ironic, sarcastic scene in the pond. So this was a, we imagine their smile, uh, we imagine their laughs, and we are uh, happy for them, sure. But from an artistic point of view, there is a lot of surrealism in those pictures. And now art historians are rediscovering them and giving them uh, some uh, credit for having introduced collage uh, and adding a layer of meaning uh, where there wasn't 
So this is what artists do. They create another meaning, another reality. Um, so this um, journey into history of photography is a coming to a close because now we have Kodak, the famous company that in 1888, thanks to George Eastman, introduced the role film. So the proper negative from which proper positives were created. So the photos on paper that we know and the first portable camera that everybody could buy. Sure, it was expensive, but at today's money, it cost about $600, so it's not impossible. This camera uh, would have been sent to you with a pre-charged um, uh, film and pre-loaded film uh, for up to 100 shots. Then you took your photos, maybe of your family, and you sent this camera back to Kodak that had the film developed. You could have had other uh, films uploaded into the camera for additional, uh, I think, 100 or 200 pounds. So it was expensive, but not impossible. And this is definitely the, the, the big bang of uh, commercial photography and with the birth of amaterial photography. And today with phones, we are all amaterial photographers. Now, the last photo I want to share with you in terms of history of photography and the self is the photo booth, which, who, which was introduced in 1925 in New York by a Russian inventor, Anatole Josefo. And this now, this is a more contemporaneous uh, photo booth. This is, let's say, uh, brings the carte de visite to the broader public and makes photography of the self affordable for different uses. Now, uh, we are going to a photo booth for passport photographs. But as you know, you can take photographies of yourself uh, in a bigger size or inviting friends in. You can take four different photographs doing strange poses. So why I'm saying that, let's now explore how photographers of today are using photography for the self. Going back to Andy Warhol that I introduced at the beginning, Andy Warhol is famous for uh, pop art, uh, but his production is very diverse. And I found fantastic um, self-portraits where he makes use of photo booth. Uh, I found a Polaroid self-portrait. In this case, he makes use of a skull. And then the third image, which is the one we saw before, it's actually a self-portrait. He asked members of his team to take a photograph. And it's a series of photographs with wigs where he then um, intervenes with paint. And these photographs are uh, printed on canvas. So what you see here, is experimentation when Andy Warhol opened a number of questions such as, is photography art? Is the possibility of having copies of the same image something that diminishes the art value of an image, the artistic value? Um, what is authorship? So if an artist go into a photo booth and presses a button, why this can't be an artwork? Why do we need a brush, a paint, and, and a, an artwork that is unique? And uh, how can you assess the importance of art? So he really opened those questions in the 60s. Uh, it, during the 60s, there was a movement called the conceptual art, where the idea of art goes beyond the object of art, it's the idea that matters. And uh, participating in this debate because those questions were highly debated and maybe today uh, they are kind of obvious, but uh, 60 years ago, they were not so obvious. What I like of these three images is that he gives a photography um, something back. It gives back its unicity. 
um, as if it was an artwork from an academy, a painting, for example. The photographs that we take in photo booths are unique. You cannot make copies of them. Photographs taken with a Polaroid are unique. And self-portraits printed on canvas with some varnish, again, uh, they are unique. So he wants to say, yes, art is, uh, sorry, is photography's art. It can be unique if uni uniqueness is what matters. But what uh, most and foremost, uh, artists can do whatever they feel like doing to convey their artistic message, even photo booth pictures. In the central image, he uses a skull. This is a tribute to a very ancient concept in art called memento mori, which means remember you have to die. But he also wants to tell us uh, something about himself. He was terrified about the idea of death. So self-portrait is not about how we appear, but how we feel. Another artist who made use of photography a lot is Joe Spence, a British artist who lived between the 30s and the 90s. And she made a lot of different possible photos of herself, mainly in this format of carte de visite or this format of photo booth, where she reenacts uh, phases of her life as a way uh, to do uh, psychological therapy, if you want. So by relieving a difficult phases of her life, she wants to be to cure herself. And she thinks photography can do that for everybody. Um, so it's also something with a feminist approach, at least um, in the period that she lived, women in media were always represented as beautiful and young. And she wants to say the everyday also brings in concepts of beauty. Even if we do our chores, why not can we be beautiful? She went through a, a trauma like breast cancer and she documented her journey through those traumatic, traumatic uh, times. And this is to say um, women are always beautiful and we have always to rethink of who we are in our life and reevaluate it and grow through that pain. Another artist that I like, Cindy Sherman, born in 1954. She keeps on taking photographs of herself, but she's never herself. She keeps on reenacting um, roles that women have covered or roles that women um, are given as a sort of stereotypes. So uh, she sees women uh, in cinema, in films, in media, in art, and she transforms herself. So it's never about herself, contrary to uh, Joe Spence, but it's about us. Again, there's a feminist stance, an activist stance. And of those images, the one I really like the most is perhaps this uh, enactment of Virgin Mary as if it was a Renaissance painting because there's a lot of um, contrast between this idea of virginity and purity and chastity and this image where um, she's always her, with her breast exposed. So there's a lot of um, controversy, I guess, and something to talk about a lot. Another artist I like, Marianne Brandt. Uh, Marianne was a German artist who lived between, uh, well, the vast majority of 1900, really. And she was an important student and then teacher of the famous Bauhaus School, which was closed by uh, Gestapo in 1932. As you could maybe remember, the Bauhaus School aimed at creating a new form of art for the new humanity that emerged from the ashes of the First World War. And they felt academies were old. They couldn't represent the art for those times. They needed a new artist. Art needed to think of the basic shapes, triangle, uh, the square, the rectangle, 
the round shapes and assemble those shapes and create a new form of art in painting, in photography, in furniture, in design. Marianne was especially active in the photography workshop uh, together with the furniture workshop and design, let's say. And here she plays with a round shape in the window and in the, here with uh, round mirrors. So it's not about herself, but it's about this new world she wants to contribute to build. Uh, we are going to have a very interesting art history mini course over the course of February with art historian Miriam Deckers, who is currently writing her PhD on Bauhaus women artists. And she's going to present to us uh, um, the um, weaving workshop, the photography workshop, and the uh, furniture one. Um, so I hope you can join um, later in February. Now, we talked about the famous image shared by the Duchess of Cambridge. And as I said, this image and this self-portrait has the aim to uh, build a brand around her role, the future queen, concert queen. Um, the Duchess is graduated in history of art uh, with a focus on history of photography, and she's the patron of the National Portrait Gallery, who commissioned the portraits of the Duchess herself. So this image of the Duchess of Cambridge and the other two are now part of the collection of the National Portrait Gallery, and we are going hopefully to see those images soon. Now, all newspapers um, immediately, at least in Great Britain, understood uh, the link. The link was uh, those beautiful Victorian images of royals, uh, in this case, Princess Alexandra of Denmark, who became the Queen Consort, so she married the Prince of Wales, and she is here portrayed with her body twisted, looking at the audience with this beautiful gown. And so the idea is to repurpose the same image for today's audience. Um, this image uh, back in 1864 is an albumen print mounted on card. Albumen is the egg white. And this is how paper was treated to be used as a printed, a printed uh, image from, I guess, the collodion process in this case. Now, the image of the princess, uh, so the Duchess of Cambridge is taken by a famous photographer. So the image, so she's not the artist. So it's not a self-portrait, but everything is uh, studied to say, um, although the Duchess of Cambridge is not uh, of royal heritage herself, she's working hard to make sure um, the royal message brand uh, of the positive people is, is going on. The, the Alexander of Denmark, Princess Alexander of Denmark, was a keen amateur photographer, and she gave us a very nice images of domestic life within the royal family. So is uh, the Duchess of Cambridge. So it's a matter of hobbies, interests, education, and mission. So a very interesting choice. So to sum up, let's recap. We have seen the history of self-representation self -representation in photography uh, from daguerreotypes, very personal uses of the images, collectibles, uh, public images, photo montages by aristocratic ladies in the UK. And then we explored how some of the many artists who make use of uh, photography to self represent for self-representation have used uh, photography and what it means. Of course, there are many more, uh, but I guess these are very interesting already. Now, before we end this talk, and I hope you have time to stay with me for an informal chat. And for those of you on YouTube, um, I hope you liked the talk so far. I, I'm having future events. I'm having other events going on. So the next uh, art cafe like this one uh, will be in a month time, Wednesday, the 16th of February. And it will be about architecture, the new Battersea development project. 
And I'm going also to offer art history mini courses on Wednesday, the 2nd of February. I'm going to talk about women artists in Renaissance, a fantastic period for women artists. And then as anticipated before, uh, art historian Miriam Deckers uh, is going to offer three classes on Bauhaus women artists. You can take one or three, it's up to you, they are priced individually. And then in person tours, uh, there's, a, there's a series of tours I'm going to do on representation of women in museums. We're going to start at the National Gallery this coming Saturday. And for representation of women, I mean women as represented in paintings, women artists and women patrons, women who commission art. So this Saturday, part one, and the following Saturday, part two. So thank you very much for following me. Uh, please subscribe my YouTube channel. And for those of you on YouTube, thank you very much for following me.